Good evening. As the third national lockdown nears an end, we're starting to appreciate the immense cost of the three lockdowns to us all, economically, educationally, physically, mentally. But perhaps the full relational cost of the lockdown is only just beginning to be felt. Lockdown has put enormous strain on many marriages. Back in September 2020, Citizens Advice said that views on its divorce webpage were up 25% compared to the previous year. Family lawyers were predicting a divorce boom as couples struggled to cope with the stress of the pandemic or were forced to face up to old problems in their marriages, which they were previously content to ignore. And months have ticked by since September 2020. Lockdown has also enforced loneliness on many single people. It's cut off from many the healthy opportunities for interaction with others. And it's given plenty of time for the painful emotions to be amplified many times over. The agony of a divorce, the frustrated desire to be married, the wrench of having recently lost a loved one. And these all things that I've mentioned will be issues for some of you right now. And in these kind of situations, we just want to cry out for relief. No more. That's enough. I just need a pressure release valve. I've got to get out of this. And if that's what we're looking for, then Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25 may feel like the wrong Bible passage to be looking at. After all, we don't want anyone rubbing salt in our wounds, telling us what our marriages should be like when they're not, or reminding us that we're still single when we don't want to be. But Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, is exactly what we need to hear. We need perspective. We need God's perspective. And this evening we're going to do a Doctor Who travel, uh, time travel style uh, journey. We're going to go back in time to Genesis chapter 2. But it's with a return ticket. We're coming back to the present day. So we'll go back to the first marriage ever. And then we'll return to today with all the trials that we face, but with a fresh perspective, God willing. So let's pray. Father God, as we spend time thinking about the world's first ever marriage, please help us to be captivated by your beautiful design for marriage, to honour marriage more, and to face our present realities with greater courage and joy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, I've got three simple points to help us go through Genesis chapter 2, verses, 1, verses 18 to 25. And my first point is this. The problem. Adam needs help to look after God's creation. That's verses 18 to 20. The problem. Adam needs help to look after God's creation. Now, from the first couple of chapters in Genesis, I'm sure we've got used to the familiar rhythm that each part of God's creation uh, brings as it's created. God's verdict is good. This, this part of creation is good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. So it comes as a bit of a shock when we read that something is not good. Um, not that there was anything bad, morally wrong or evil before the fall in Genesis 3. But something was not good in the sense that something was missing. Look at verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So Adam needs help. <clears throat> Now, we men are notoriously reluctant to admit that we need help, whether it's getting lost in a car in an unfamiliar part of town or perhaps moving furniture in an impromptu lockdown furniture shuffle. But God sees that Adam needs help and he's going to get him help. We'll see that later. But what does Adam need help with exactly? Well, let's rewind a little. So chapter 2, verse 5 of Genesis, we read that there was no man to work the ground. <clears throat> so that's the hint. So God then forms Adam from the dust and sets him to work. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. 
But Adam needs help to look after God's creation. He can't do it on his own. It's a lot to manage. So the search begins for a helper. Verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord God had made, Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, <clears throat> there was not found a helper fit for him. So there, there's Adam, he throws himself into zoology and ornithology with lots of gusto. But there doesn't seem to be a suitable helper for him. A lion? Uh, probably a bit dangerous. Hippopotamus? Mm, T bit hot-tempered, rather not. Alligator? Frankly, that smile's a little bit off-putting. But fortunately, God has a solution to this problem. We read in verse 18 that God himself will make a helper suitable for Adam. Someone who will uh, help him to bring up many children as well, to help him in the task in the future. And there's a really important point for us to grasp here and it's that marriage is not God's answer to loneliness it's God's provision for partnership marriage is not God's ultimate answer for loneliness it's God's provision for partnership you see the issue for Adam here was not that he felt subjectively alone if you think about it he probably didn't feel alone because Genesis 2 was before the fall and he was in perfect communion with God. But he was objectively, physically alone, on, as in on his own. And God had called him to look after all the creation, which was far beyond what he could do on his own. So God did not create Eve to meet Matt Adam's emotional needs primarily, but rather to help Adam care for creation, both by her own contribution as they worked together, and then by having children with him. And I think this point has big implications in terms of the expectations that we place on our marriages or on the hope of a future marriage, if we're not married and we would like to get married. And I'm gonna say this carefully, but I, it's important, I think, to underline it. Marriage was not created by God to take away loneliness or to fulfill our deepest emotional needs. Certainly good marriage can help combat isolation and loneliness. But God has also given us other good relationships that help with those things, like wider family and good friendships and the church family as well. Healthy marriage always has an outward focus. And for Christians today, this is um, not just looking after God's good creation, which is what Adam and Eve were called directly to do. And I suppose today that would involve caring for our natural environment and uh, the order, good order of human society. But also for Christians today, we're involved in the kingdom work of seeing God's kingdom grow, of growing the church by sharing the good news of Jesus with others. So that's the problem. That's the problem. Adam needs help to look after God's creation. My second point is this, the solution. God gives Eve to Adam to help him. The solution, God gives Eve to Adam to help him. That's verses 21 to 25. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it in this way, but the first ever marriage was actually an arranged marriage. It was beautifully and purposefully arranged by God. Um, look at verse 21. So firstly, God makes Eve from Adam. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So in verse 7 of chapter 2, God makes Adam from dust, but here God makes Eve from Adam. So God makes Eve from Adam, but secondly, God makes Eve for Adam. Look at verse 22 again. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. 
So God here is like the father of the bride at a wedding, giving away Eve, his daughter, to Adam. And Adam is thrilled to bits. Look at verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You see, Adam wasn't so thrilled with the lion or the rhino or the alligator, but he's thrilled with Eve. She's wonderful. Praise God for Eve. She's the companion and the partner he's been desperately waiting for. The one who is like him, even from him, and yet different to him. And those li that line in verse 23 is a prelude to all the rich love poetry there is in the Bible, in the Song of Songs, in parts of the book of Proverbs. And in verse 25, we get a glimpse of the intimacy of their relationship. Verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And that's not just talking about physical nakedness, but it's talking about complete emotional openness and trust. It's this perfect relationship to which what we'll see next time in Genesis, in chapter 3, verse 7, forms a sad contrast where Adam and Eve are naked, but they're ashamed. Here, naked, not ashamed, perfect intimacy and unity of, of mind. What a beautiful picture of that first arranged marriage. God makes Eve for Adam, from Adam, to Adam's delight, for service together in the garden. So do you see here the tenderness, the care, the foresight, the purpose, the delicacy of God at work here as he orchestrates this first ever human marriage? People can be cynical about marriage today. They think it's old fashioned or boring or restrictive. And often underneath that cynicism probably lies the pain of many broken marriages. Either people have had first hand or the experience they've had second hand or growing up in a broken family. But that's simply not the picture of marriage we see in Genesis 2. Marriage is not boring and old fashioned. It's beautifully original. And as we'll see in a moment, just as Adam's marriage with Eve was really special, so every human marriage today is really special as well. Beautifully original. So that's the story of the first ever marriage. There was a problem. Adam needed help to look after creation. There was this God-given solution to Eve was given by God to Adam to help him. And my third and final point takes us on the return leg of our Doctor Who time travel trip. It's back to marriage today. And it's this. My third point is the pattern of marriage. God joins one man and one woman together for life. That's verse 24. God joins one man and one woman together for life. Now in verse 24, there's an intentional break in the narrative. So the writer of Genesis pauses to make a general profound theological comment which is referred to many times over in the New Testament. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So the writer of Genesis is saying that what happened to Adam and Eve in that first human marriage is the pattern for all human marriages for all time. I'll say that again. What happened to Adam and Eve in the first ever human marriage is a pattern for all human marriages for all time. The pattern. Now, some things were quite obviously unique about Adam and Eve's marriage. I mean, the creation of Eve from Adam was unique. Secondly, Adam and Eve's marriage was arranged. Uh, marriages today can be arranged, but they don't have to be. Thirdly, Adam and Eve had no parents to cleave, to, to leave before they cleaved together. But verse 24 insists that their marriage forms the theological pattern for all human marriages to come, everywhere for all time until Jesus comes back. So here's God's blueprint for marriage. And we'll look at each of these um, parts in more detail and apply them as we go. Firstly, there's the public recognition of marriage as 
one man and one woman leave their respective families to form a new family unit. Secondly, there's the passionate commitment of marriage as the couple hold fast to each other. And thirdly, there's the profound union of marriage as the man and woman become one flesh. And these three things happen in every marriage between one man and one woman, regardless of whether or not people acknowledge it, regardless of what they believe in deeds, because marriage is given by God as an ordinance of creation for everyone. So let's look at um, each of these three points and consider the implications. Firstly, marriage, the public recognition of marriage. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Today we often approach marriage very individualistically. We see marital privacy as a sacred right and married couples expect to be given space and others dare not ask too many questions about their marriage for fear of coming across as nosy. But I think for every one busybody who sticks his or her nose into other people's marriages too much, there are probably 10 of us who feel far too comfortable walking by on the other side when we sense that a couple's marriage is in serious difficulty. I remember speaking with one man who bravely shared with me the story of the failure of his first marriage. He and his wife had got into real difficulties in their relationship but no one had helped them and time moved on the relationship um, got more strained the difficulties became insurmountable and eventually they split up and they were divorced now i think it's easy to point the finger at this man and criticize him for not working through the issues that he faced with his wife but surely the better question to be asking is this when he needed help when he and his wife needed help where was the help that they needed you see, healthy marriages are the responsibility of human society, not just the couple. And they are the responsibility of the whole church family, not just the couple. Single people, I think, can play a very important role here too, because you can ask more easily to married couples, how is your marriage going? And not be perceived by them as being critical in a way that it's more difficult for those of us, perhaps, who are married to do unless we know um, the couple well. So do you know a married couple who are really struggling with their marriage during lockdown? Could you prayerfully consider one thing you could do to help them this week? Or do you know someone who's about to get married or someone who's just got married? Surely now more than ever with this current climate and circumstances we're in, they will need your support. Brothers and sisters, let us not be content just to speak highly of marriage as an institution. Let our actions back up our words. Let's support those inside and outside the church to cultivate healthy marriages as best as we can help. As Hebrews 13 verse 4 says simply, let marriage be held in honour among all. <coughs> That's the public recognition of marriage. Marriage is the responsibility of the whole community, the whole church community, not just the couple. Secondly, let's look at the passionate commitment of marriage. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Our culture often judges a marriage by feelings of happiness or the absence of conflict. But at its heart, marriage involves a steadfast, tenacious, passionate commitment to love your husband or wife, even if romance is not happening and even if arguments are many, even in the middle of a third lockdown. So if that's where you are now, well, don't give up on your marriage. Persevere. Don't put unhelpful pressure on yourselves by thinking you must feel passionate feelings or agree on everything all the time, but just resolve to be passionately committed to each other. I know that doesn't sound very romantic, but it is realistic. And it takes away the performance pressure of, of our marriages and helps us to simply persevere in faithful commitment through times of romance and harmony, through times of coldness and strife. 
That's the passionate commitment of marriage. Marriage requires passionate commitment to sustain it, not passionate feelings. Finally, let's see the profound union of marriage. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, there's something that's really important to grasp here. Fundamentally, marriage is God's doing, not our doing. Marriage is something God does for us, not something we do for God, fundamentally. Of course, marriage is also a human commitment. The man and the woman make an active decision to leave and cleave. They make real promises to each other. But becoming one flesh, God does that for every man and woman when they marry. I'll spell this out a bit more because it's hard to grasp. Marriage is more than a legal contract between two parties. Marriage is also more than a lifelong commitment expressed publicly in a church in the context of supportive family and friends and before God himself. Marriage is actually God's doing as he unites the man and the woman together in one flesh union, of which sexual intimacy is the deepest human expression. And this one flesh status is not something, a uh, kind of marriage ideal that we need to become or we need to live up to. It's given to us when we marry, when God joins us together. Jesus emphasises this point in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. Verse 4, he answered the Pharisees, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, here's the quote from Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then here's Jesus' summary. Verse 6, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What well, therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So if you're married, you're one with your husband and wife. Yes, you are two individuals, but you're also one, united. God has united you together in marriage for life. And that one flesh union in marriage is also a picture of God's relationship, the relationship between Jesus Christ and Christian believers. <coughs> Paul writes in... Ephesians 5, verses 31 to 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. The mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Paul is writing about the profound union of human marriage, and as he does so, he's also writing about the profound union of Christ and the church. So why was marriage created? Well, it was created by God as a one flesh union between a man and a woman for life. It was also created by God to picture the spiritual union between Jesus Christ and his church forever. And if you're a Christian believer, that includes you. That's something you are part of, whether you're single, married, divorced, bereaved recently, single through bereavement. If you're watching and you've not yet had personal dealings with Jesus for whatever reason, maybe you sense that you're missing out. As Augustine put it, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And maybe it's high time for you to come to Jesus, that he might join you to God, not just for this life, but after, through death and into eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift of marriage. May we as a church family honour marriage, honour you through our marriages, and may our marriages point everyone around us to the great marriage on the last day between Jesus and his church. In Jesus' name, Amen.